Good morning, this is Professor Shannon Gracie from Maricosta College. Today we'll be going over section 4.4 .4 from the uh, Larson and Edwards calculus text, which covers the fundamental theorem of calculus. So for those of you who weren't a huge fan <laughs> of the limit definition um, of the definite integral, we'll be learning a way that in some ways, you know, is much easier, but in other ways it's it can be a little bit on the difficult side, mainly because there can be some tricky antiderivatives that one needs to learn how to find. Okay, so um, anyway, we'll be we'll be going over how to evaluate a definite integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus, um, and then we'll go over the mean value theorem for integrals and average value of a function over a closed interval. And then um, we'll also be checking out the second fundamental theorem of calculus and the net change theorem. All right, so um, here we go. Drum roll. <laughs> the fundamental theorem of calculus is um, basically Remember that we learned yesterday that, you know, if all the conditions are correct, that the um, limit as the norm of delta approaches zero, the width of the largest subinterval approaches zero, of the summation from i equals 1 to n of f at xi times delta xi is equal to the integral from a to b of f at x dx. Now, what you're going to learn is this. You're going to learn that in the fundamental theorem of calculus, remember the capital F denoted an antiderivative. So you'll find an antiderivative. And so what, what we're going to learn is that this is the anti an antiderivative evaluated at the upper limit of integration minus the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit of integration. Now the constant, since this ends up being the same antiderivative, the constant zeroes out and I'll go into that a little bit more in a bit. So let's check out why this works, okay? So the, the proof of this guy So basically, what the evil plan is, is we want to write this difference, um, capital F at B minus capital F at A, in a convenient form. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to let delta be any partition. on the closed interval from A to B. Right? So what will happen is we'll get A is equal to X0 and X0 is going to have to be less than X1 which is less than X2 which is less than dot 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 less than Xn which equals B. Okay so basically um, these are all the different subintervals that that are the subintervals for our partition. Okay, so basically, we can write capital F at B minus capital F at A as capital F at what do you think? Good X N. Right. minus capital F, let's put in an Xn minus 1, and then plus capital F at Xn minus 1. Nah, let's do more. Okay, so basically, 
Okay, so basically what we would have for, for each of these things, okay, is we would end up having the sum of all these of all these definite integrals. So we would have capital F at xn minus capital F at xn minus 1, right, plus capital F at xn minus 1 minus capital F at xn minus 2 and that would go on until we get down to capital F at x2 minus capital F at x1 plus capital F at x1 minus capital F at x0. So what do you notice is going to happen with all that stuff? Our capital F at xn minus capital F at xn minus 1 plus capital F at xn minus 1. I'm just taking off the parentheses here. And then minus capital F at xn minus 2. And then we'll have plus dot 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 till we get down to, so it'll be, you know, this alternating plus and minus till we get down to plus capital F at x1 minus capital F at x0, okay? So what we'll get for this guy is we'll get the summation from i equals 1 to n of capital F at x i minus capital F at x i minus 1. So, by the mean value theorem, we know there exists some number c i, right, in the ith interval such that f prime at c i is equal to capital F at x i minus capital F at x i minus 1 all over x i minus x i minus 1. We know that f prime at c i is equal to f at c i and so from here we can let delta x i equal to that's just change in x i would be x i minus x i minus 1 and from here what we would get is <coughs> sorry about that from here what we would get is and remember we were dealing with f at b minus f at a for all this time so capital F at b minus capital F at a is going to equal to the summation from i equals 1 to n of f at c i times delta x i but what is that? We know that is the integral from a to b of f at x with respect to x. Okay?
So um, this is the, uh, the proof for the fundamental theorem of calculus, okay? So here we go with our next step here we'll be looking at guidelines. So these are some guidelines for using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So here we go. Again, you know, the big key is you have to be able to find an antiderivative of f. So this leads back to the, the stuff you did in section 4.1, um, which were uh, um, finding antiderivatives or indefinite integrals. So we now have a way to evaluate a definite integral without having to use the limit of a sum, which is good. Uh, but we do have to find an antiderivative. So here we go. When, when applying, the fundamental theorem of calculus, the following notation is good. So you want to know, you know, what you're plugging in here. So basically, you find this here, right here, is the an antiderivative right? And you're evaluating it from x is a to x is b, okay? So, um, we don't have to include the constant of integration because as you can see here, it's the same antiderivative that you found. So the C's literally zero out. So here are some helpful hints that, that I've come up with. All right, and these are things that you'll wanna be able to, to do. When, remember, there's no formula for the quotient of two functions unless, you know, one of them is a constant. So what you're gonna need to do is you're going to need to divide through if you have a monomial, right? You can also use long division to see what you can change your um, integrand or how you can rewrite your integrand. We'll be using that technique quite a bit when we get to chapter five, okay? But here we've turned this here, which has no formula, into this guy here, which um, you would use, you know, a combination of the sum and sum or difference of functions uh, formula for antiderivatives and also the constant multiple rule and also the uh, power rule, general power rule, okay? Actually, it's the power rule. We'll, we'll learn the general power rule in the next section. Okay, so products of functions uh, with the, you know, exception of a constant times a function have to, have to be multiplied out in some way, shape, or form. So here, this one would be the integral from A to B, whatever those limits were, of what? Good. 2x squared, and then we'll have minus x plus 6x, so plus 5x minus 3 with respect to x. And again, you've changed it into something that we have a formula for, okay? So trig functions. Use identities. You can try to change everything from to sines and cosines. Uh, Pythagorean conjugates come up a lot. Um, you want to generate a difference of squares situation, so you can change the denominator from two terms to one. So um, basically, you know, the Pythagorean conjugates, um, you've got one plus sine at x, times 1 minus sine at x is one minus sine squared at x, which is cosine squared at x. Um, if you had, you know, again, one plus cosine at x times one minus sine at x, that would be one minus Nope, sorry, 1 minus cosine at x. <laughs> You'd end up with 1 minus cosine squared at x, which is sine squared at x. 
And then what are some other ones that you can think of? Squared at x, sometimes that might come up in some way, shape, or, or form as a, you know, as a uh, Pythagorean, Pythagorean conjugate you'll have to do. Um, also, um, remember that cotangent squared at x plus 1 is equal to cosecant squared at x. Okay? So, anyway, these are um, specific examples of Pythagorean conjugates, and these are, so these are, um, so each of these guys, these pairs, are called the Pythagorean conjugates. Okay? And then these, of course, are, you know, actually I can just write all of them. Um, sine squared at x plus cosine squared at x is 1. And so these guys here are the Pythagorean identities. Okay, so now actually let's take a look at this guy and um, let's evaluate the whole thing. So instead of having from A to B, let's uh, Let's go ahead and have this guy from how about pi over 4 to pi over 3 instead. So what we would need to do is what? Good we would need to do some side work, right? So we would need to take this 1 over 1 plus sine at x, right? And we'd need to multiply this by 1 minus sine at x in the numerator and denominator, right, to balance it out. So this is going to give us 1 minus sine at x in our numerator over 1 minus sine squared at x and that is 1 minus sine at x over cosine squared at x and now comes a little bit of a tricky part, okay? So this gives us 1 over cosine squared at x minus sine at x now we're going to be tricky here. Cosine squared at x is cosine at x multiplied to itself twice, right? So we're going to write it as cosine at x and then times 1 over cosine at x. And what is this? This gives us <laughs> secant squared at x. Sorry, my dog's howl when a siren goes by. <laughs> so secant squared at x minus um, sine at x over cosine at x is tangent at x, and then times secant at x. And what you may remember is that the secant squared at x has an ant is, is um, has an antiderivative, and then we can commute these factors and write them as secant at x times tangent at x, and that one has an antiderivative. So that's our scratch work. All right, so coming back, this is going to be the integral from pi over 4 to pi over 3 of, and what did we get? Secant squared at x minus secant at x times tangent at x with respect to x. So we've rewritten that whole thing. Now we can split those um, two and we can write this as pi over, the integral from pi over 4 to pi over 3 of secant squared at x with respect to x 
minus the integral from pi over 4 to pi over 3 of secant at x times tangent at x with respect to x. So what is the antiderivative for secant squared at x? Good, tangent at x. And tangent at x will be evaluated from x equals pi over 4 to x equals pi over 3. And then the next one is beautiful, secant at x. And secant at x will be evaluated from x equal pi over 4 to x equals pi over 3. So this is going to give us tangent at pi over 3 minus tangent at pi over 4. So that's that first integral, and then minus secant at pi over 3 minus secant at pi over 4. That's our second integral. Okay, so the tangent at pi over 3, let's see, sine at pi over 3 is root 3 over 2, so we'll end up with root 3 tangent at pi over 4 is 1, and then secant at pi over 3 is going to be what? Root 2? No, 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 no. I'm making it up. Just 2, because cosine at pi over 3 is a half, so it would be 1 over a half. And then minus secant at pi over 4 is going to be the root 2. So you can clean this up a little bit and get um, root, root 3 plus root 2 and minus 3. Then we're done. All right? So that's, you know, kind of a harder, <laughs> a harder version. Um, I just wanted to, to get you, get you, uh, throw you in the deep end of the pool, I guess. Um, but here we go. Here are some here are some, you know, other other um, things that we've we've done before using the harder stuff. So here, let's identify what we have. So this our function that we're dealing with is just six. Do you see that? And our a is negative two, and our b is six. So when we find an antiderivative here, what do we get? Good, this is going to be 6x, right? So our antiderivative we found to be 6x. And we're evaluating this from x equals negative 2 to x equals 6. So our f at b, right, is going to be capital F at negative 2, which is... So we'll have 6 times 6 minus 6 times negative 2, right? So what did we get for, sorry, f at b, my bad, is going to be f at 6. And what is f at 6? Good, f at 6 is 36, right? We get 36 right here. And f at negative 2 would be negative 12. So f at a is f at negative 2, which is negative 12. So at the end of the day, what do we get? 36 plus 12, we get 48. Good so far? Awesome. All right. So next up. Let's look at this one, and please feel free to got, to pause the movie and truck along by yourself and see how you do. So this next one, um, our lowercase, the stuff we can fill out now, so our function is 2x squared plus 1, and a is 6, my bad, a is 1, I should have probably switched those, and b is 6, 
So our f at b will be f at 6, and our f at a would be f at 1. All right, so what is, what is our capital F at x going to be? So we're going to have 2x cubed over 3, right, plus x. And we're evaluating that from x is 1 to x is 6. So our capital F at x was, I'll just write it as 2 thirds x cubed plus x. So now what we'll have is evaluating at that upper limit of integration, I'm going to have 2 thirds times, good, 6 cubed plus 6 minus 2 thirds times 1 cubed plus 1. And what's that going to give me? So I'll have 2 thirds times, what is that, 216 I think for 6 cubed, and then plus 6 minus 2 thirds plus 1. And then, let's see, I know 3 can divide out some of this, so we'll get 72 there. So we'll have 144 plus 6 for our upper limit of integration, minus 2 thirds plus 1 <clears throat> is going to be 5 thirds. So this is 150, so f at 6 was 150. minus 5 thirds, and then getting a common denominator, what would that be? 4, 450 minus 5 all over 3, which is 445 thirds. Okay, so f at 1 was our 5 thirds capital F at 1. So that's evaluating the antiderivative. Right. Good so far? Awesome. All right. Now, this next guy, what do we have going on? We have a product of two functions and one of them is not a constant, right? So what do we need to do? Let's do a little work rewriting first. So this is equivalent to the integral from 0 to 2 of 2t to the 1 half minus t to the 3 halves with respect to t. So our, f, our function is 2t to the 1 half minus t to the 3 halves. Our a is 0, our b is 2, so f at b will be capital, our antiderivative evaluated at 2, and this will be our antiderivative evaluated at 0. Okay, so let's check it out. So we get 2 times t to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves minus t to the 5 halves divided by 5 halves. This is going to go from x is 0 to x is 2. Cleaning that up a bit, we can write that as 4 thirds t to the 3 halves minus 2 fifths t to the 5 halves and we're evaluating this whole thing from x is 0 to x is 2. So our antiderivative at t ends up being 4 thirds t to the 3 halves minus 2 fifths t to the 5 halves. 
And so now we need to evaluate our limits of integration. So first off, we're going to do x is 2. So 4 thirds times 2 to the 3 halves minus 2 fifths times t to the 5 halves. Oops, it'll be 2 to the 5 halves. That's our upper limit. And then our lower limit of integration will be 4 thirds times 0 to the 3 halves minus 2 fifths times 0 to the 5 halves. And do you see that this guy just zeroes out, f at 0 is 0, capital F at 0 is 0. Now let's clean up this guy. So this is going to be 4 thirds. Now 2 to the 3 halves is the same as what? Root 2, whoops, root 2 cubed. And this guy is going to be 2 fifths times root 2 to the fifth. So that gives us 4 thirds times 2 root 2, right, minus 2 fifths. And then remember that's root 2 times root 2, which is 2, times root 2 times root 2, which is another 2. So you get 4 and then times root 2. So we will get eight thirds root 2 minus eight fifths root 2. So we have like terms. So we just need a common denominator of 15, right? So that would be 40 fifteenths root 2 minus 24 fifteenths root 2, which will give us, let's see, 40 minus 24 is 16 fifteenths times root 2. And we're done. So this ends up being 16 fifteenths times root 2. How are we doing so far? Good? Awesome. All right, so next up we've got this guy. What do you think we should do here? Beautiful. We need to expand this cube, right? So this is going to be equivalent to the integral from 1 to 4 of Two v cubed times five to the zero plus three times two v squared times five to the one plus three times two v to the one plus oops times five squared and then we'll have plus 2v to the 0 times 5 cubed. So I just, I just use the um, Pascal's triangle to help expand that. So this will be the integral from 1 to 4 of, that's going to give us 8v cubed plus, let's see, that will be 60 We'll have 4 times 5 is 20, so 60v squared plus 25 times 6 is 150 times v, and then plus 125. Good so far? So our function we found to be 8v cubed plus 60v squared plus 150v plus 125. Our a is 1, our b is 4. We're going to need to find that antiderivative and evaluate it at 4 and then evaluate it at 1. Okay, so next step we shall have 
8v to the 4th over 4 plus 60v cubed over 3 plus 150v squared over 2 plus 125v and we're going to evaluate that from v is 1 to v is 4. So this will just give us 2v to the 4th plus 20v cubed plus 75v squared plus 125v evaluated from v is 1 to v is 4. So our upper limit of integration will be 2 times 4 to the 4th plus 20 times 4 cubed plus 75 times 4 squared plus 125 times 4 minus, now everything is going to be 1 to the 4th, 1 cubed, 1 squared, etc. So do you see we'll just get minus 2 plus 20 well, I'll, I'll plug it in so you see it. 2 times 1 to the 4th plus 20 times 1 cubed plus 75 times 1 squared plus 125 times 1. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to my calculator with me. <laughs> um, 4 to the 4th should be, what, 256? I'll double check it. Yep, 256. And then 2 times 256 is 512. And then 4 cubed is 64, and 64 times 20 is 1280. And then we have uh, 75 times 16 is 1200. And 125 times 4 is, six, is 500. minus 2 plus 20 plus 75 plus 125. So we'll get, let's see, 512 plus 1280 plus 1200 and then plus 500 gives us 3,492. So that is our antiderivative evaluated of 4. And then minus, what's that going to be? 22 222. So this is 222. So then we should get 3,270 for our final result. How are we doing? Good so far? So, oh, and our capital F at V ended up being 2V to the fourth plus 20V cubed plus 75V squared plus 125V. Alrighty, so here were a few, you know, here's a few examples. Um, this one here, example two, what was the trick? We need to rework it, don't we? So this will be the integral from pi over 6 to pi over 3 of 1 over 1 minus cosine at x. And then what do we need to do with this? Beautiful. Times it by... 1 plus cosine at x over 1 plus cosine at x. 
because we want to generate that difference of squares situation. And this is all with respect to x. So this is going to end up being the integral from pi over 6 to pi over 3 of 1 plus cosine at x over 1 minus cosine squared at x with respect to x, which will give us the integral from pi over 6 to pi over 3 of 1 plus cosine at x over, good, sine squared at x with respect to x. Now that is going to give us, so we'll split the integral, and we'll have 1 over sine squared at x with respect to x plus cosine at x, the integral from pi over 6 to pi over 3, of cosine at x over sine at x times 1 over sine at x with respect to x. And then finishing off this, the quote unquote simplification, <laughs> we will have 1 over sine squared at x is cosecant squared at x with respect to x. And then this guy is going to be cotangent at x times cosecant at x with respect to x. And remember that that second one you can commute those terms to make it look exactly like your antiderivative and you'll have cosecant at x times cotangent at x with respect to x. All right, so our, our function, uh, remember we haven't integrated, is cosecant squared at x plus cosecant at x times cotangent at x if you put it back together. Our a is pi over 6 and our b is pi over 3, and we're going to be evaluating capital F at pi over 3 and capital F at pi over 6. All right, so let's find our antiderivative. So we're going to end up with beautiful negative cotangent at x. That's going to be for x going from pi over 6 to pi over 3 and then plus negative cosecant at x, and that's going from x is pi over 6 to x is pi over 3. So our, if you put it, it had kept it in 1, you would have gotten negative cotangent at x minus cosecant at x as your antiderivative. So now this will be negative cotangent. So the first one will be negative cotangent at pi over 3 minus negative cotangent at pi over 6. So that's the first definite integral. And then this will be plus negative cosecant at pi over 6 minus negative cosecant at pi over 3. So then we will get negative what? cotangent at pi over 3 is 1 over root 3 and then plus cotangent at pi over 6 is going to be what? root 3 and then we'll get minus cosecant at pi over negative cosecant at pi well minus cosecant at pi over 6 is what? Two 
2 and then plus cosecant at pi over 3 is going to be So sine at pi, at pi over 3 is root 3 over 2, right? And it'd be flipped. So it'd be 2 over root 3. So basically, these guys here Oh, I flipped those. I'm sorry, you guys. I should have done, um, sorry about that. I should have done pi over 3 and then minus pi over 6 so it would switch these. So this would end up being um, minus cosecant at pi over 3 was um, the 2 over root 3 and then plus that guy is going to be 2. Okay, so we'll end up with a result of negative 3 over root 3 plus root 3 plus 2. Now negative 3 over root 3, if you rationalize, multiply by root 3 over root 3, you actually just get root 3. So that would be negative root 3 plus root 3 plus 2, which is just 2, believe it or not. Okay? So this one we did differently. Um, so on this guy, I, I separated separated the terms. So we did it a bit differently. We'll just put our end result of 2. All right? OK. So moving right along, um, we've got this next guy. So why don't we go ahead and pause the movie and you give this one a try and see how you do. Okay, so now let's uh, take a look at this one and please, you know, pause the movie and try it on your own first and then if you have any trouble you can always follow along with me, alright? So on your mark, set, go! You can do it. Alright, let's see how you did. First of all, what do we have to do? Good, we have to rewrite this, the, uh, this integral as the integral from 2 to 6. And when we expand out that square, we're going to have x to the fourth, oops, x to the fourth um, minus 16x squared plus 64 with respect to x. So now we're ready to perform the integration. So now we can say that our function is x to the fourth minus 16x squared plus 64. Um, our a is 2, b is 6. This would be capital F at 6, so our antiderivative evaluated at 6 and this would be our antiderivative evaluated at 2. And let's find out what that antiderivative is. So see that we'll get x to the fifth over 5 minus 16x cubed over 3 plus 64x and that's going to be evaluated from x equals 2 to x equals 6. So now we can put in that our antiderivative, I'll write it as 1 fifth x to the fifth minus 16 thirds x cubed plus 64 x. And then moving along, we will have, this will be 6 to the fifth over 5 minus 16 thirds times 6 cubed plus 64 times 6 
that's our upper limit of integration minus our lower limit of integration, which will be 2 to the fifth over 5 minus 16 thirds times 2 cubed plus 64 times 2. So what we'll have with this is we will have so 6 to the fifth will give us 7,776 fifths minus 16 thirds times 216 plus, what's that going to be, 384, that's our upper limit, minus 32 fifths minus 16 times 8. What is 16 times 8? 128. So we'll have 128 thirds plus 128. Well, that's our lower limit. So um, let's see. 3 divides 216, it'll be 72 times. And let's just go ahead and break out the graphing calculator so we can we can uh, get this done more quickly. So what did we have? We have 9 by 5 and then minus 16 times 72 and then plus 384 enter and then math enter That'll be 39.36 over 5 for the first one. Whoops. So that is what capital F at 6 is. So the, our antiderivative evaluated at 6 is that. And then minus. Coming back to our calculator, we'll have, oops, 32 fifths minus 128 thirds plus 128. So that gives us 1376 over 15. And so the final result oops, will be Okay, so we'll get 10,432 over 15, 10,432 over 15, and we're all done. Okay? Awesome. All right, so now here's an application. So we want to find the area of the region bounded by the graphs of these equation, equations. So um, here, if you just kind of identify everything, um, our A is good zero whoops 
and our b is 8, and our function is 1 plus, I'm going to write it as x to the 1 -third. And on the interval from 0 to 8, do you see that our function will be non-negative? Good. So therefore, what will happen is our, the definite integral of this function from 0 to 8 will also give us the area. Okay? So here we go. So our area is equal to the integral from 0 to 8 of 1 plus x to the 1 third with respect to x. And then we'll have our area equals x plus x to the 4 thirds over 4 thirds evaluated from x is 0 to x is 8. So our area will be x plus 3 fourths x to the 4 thirds evaluated from x is 0 to x is 8. So our antiderivative was x plus 3 fourths times x to the 4 thirds. And continuing, we will have eight plus three fourths times. So remember, it's um, power over root. So this is really going to be times the cube root of eight raised to the fourth. And then our lower limit of integration, um, you're probably going to see that it'll zero out, but I'll, I'll write out what we're plugging in here. So our lower limit is zero. So this will give us eight plus three-fourths times the cube root of eight is two, and two to the eighth is sixteen. So our area will be, let's see, 4 divided 16. So we'll get 20 square units. And our upper limit of integration was 20. Okay, so moving right along. Now we're at the um, mean value theorem for integrals, the mean value theorem for integrals. So for this guy, um, basically what we have is, I don't know, I don't, uh, let's see, I don't think I left enough room for the, the proof of this. Um, Basically, the big picture idea for the mean value theorem for integrals is basically says that, hey, the area under the curve, right, is going to be equal to this rectangle that you can make by doing the, the height of some domain value C, right, the height of the function um, at C times the interval B minus A. So let's just take a look. So if you have, you know, okay, so you have something like this, and let's just say that um, this is A and this is B, and let's suppose that we have uh, this, this curve here. Okay, and um, so if we were to make a picture, you know, of the area represented, do you see that it would be these vertical lines here, right, and then bounded by y is zero right here, and we would have
our area look something like this. Okay, so in the blue, the blue right there, so this is this is our, our function at x, right? And our the integral from a to b of f at x with respect to x is equivalent to the blue region right here. Okay? So this other part is saying, hey, there's some, if, if this, you know, if f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, then there's this domain value c in the closed interval, right, where if you make a, a rectangle, if you make a rectangle, so let's just say, um, So do you see that we've got, right here, we've got the base of the rectangle from A to B, right? So this, this length here is the B minus A, so base of the rectangle. And then here, somewhere in here, right, let's say, I think this is pretty close. If you had a height measure, that's not quite it. If you had a height measure here, okay, so right here, if this was C right here, so this would be the ordered pair C, F at C. So our C, oh, what happened to my B minus A? Did I not write it? So this, that length was B minus A. This input value right here is C, right? So this ordered pair right here is C, F at C. So what will happen is this rectangle, there's some input value here where the area of this rectangle that we made right here is equivalent to the area under the curve. All right, so that's the, the mean value theorem for integrals, and it's actually pretty cool. And it turns out that this F at C value right here F at C turns out to be, this right here, turns out to be the um, average value of the function. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at how we'd use this. All right, so here's that talk about average value. So basically, um, all that's happened here is if you isolate, um, if you were to, to isolate your F at C in the mean value theorem, for integrals, the other side of the equation is the average value of the function. So basically, if you take um, the integral from a to b of f at x dx, and you set it equal to f at c times b minus a, and divide both sides by b minus a, what would happen is you would get 1 over b minus a, times the integral from a to b of f at x dx is equal to f at c, right? And that's, that's what our, that's how you find the average value of your function on that interval. Okay, so let's take a look at this problem. Find the value or values of c guaranteed by the mean value theorem for integrals for this function. So here, Let's, uh, do you see that we're continuous on the interval from negative pi over 3 to pi over 3, so we can apply the mean value theorem. So 
let's go ahead and say what the mean value theorem is. So the integral from a to b of f at x dx is equal to f at c times b minus a. But a lot of times it's a lot easier to think of it as just f at x, okay? The f at c's can confuse you. We'll figure out what c is at the end when we look at our answers and then figure out which ones go on the interval, right? So here we go. Plugging in what we have, right, the integral from negative pi over 3 to pi over 3, and then our f at x is cosine at x with respect to x, so that's the left side, is equal to cosine at x times b minus a. So what's b? Good, pi over 3 minus negative pi over 3. So continuing, right, what is the antiderivative of cosine at x? Beautiful. It's sine at x, and we're going to evaluate sine at x from x is negative pi over 3 to x is pi over 3. And that we're going to set that equal to cosine at x times what? 2 pi over 3. Good so far? Awesome. All right, so now what we'll have here is sine at pi over 3 minus sine at negative pi over 3 is equal to 2 pi over 3 times cosine at x. So here, uh, sine at pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. Um, and then using the negative angle identity, this would be sine at negative pi over 3 is negative sine at pi over 3, so that would turn the minus sign here to a plus. So we'd have another root 3 over 2, and that's going to equal to what? 2 pi over 3 times cosine at x. So now let's um, get let's get everything over here so that this would give us root 3 when we combine those and uh, we're going to be multiplying that by 3 over 2 pi and that's equal to cosine at x and we're going to have to get an approximation for this so let's get our graphing calculators out um, and go to our, our y equals um, and let's go to our Okay, so we're gonna. I'm gonna just put mine in y4. So basically, um, we're gonna solve this equation here. So we we're gonna have one graph be cosine at x, and then the other graph is gonna be. Was it 3 times root 3 over 2 pi? So 3 times root 3 divided by 2 times pi. And we'll graph. And actually, we're, we're just on negative pi over 3 to pi over 3. So why don't we just do it, our window from negative 1 and a half to 1 and a half. And then for our y values, we'll just go from, uh, we'll do the same, negative one and a half to one and a half. And graph. 
progress. Okay. So um, we've got a symmetric graph here, so we really only need to find the intersects for one of them. So let's go to second calculate intersect, which is 5. And I'll just do the positive. First curve is this guy. Second curve is that guy. And our intersection is at approximately... Um, Let's see, 0.5971 for x. So I'll just copy that. Okay, so these are in our interval of interest. So basically, this ended up giving us um, this approximated to roughly um, 0 0.8, oops, 0 0.83 um, is approximately equal to cosine at x, and we got that x is approximately plus or minus. Uh, 0.5971 radians and um, since this is within our, our interval of interest this is our C. C is approximately plus or minus 0 0.5971. Okay? So you solved it. Now just, just so you know this 0 0.83 that's our average value. That's the average value on the interval. Cool? All right. So next up, we're asked to find the average value, right? So the we know that the average value is equal to 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f at x dx, the integral of a to b of f at x dx. So plugging in what we have, this will be equal to 1 over 3 minus 1 times the integral from 1 to 3 of 4 times x squared plus 1 over x squared with respect to x. So now this will give us one half, right? We can factor out the four from the integral and then we'll have x squared plus one over x squared with respect to x. So this will give us two times the integral from one to three. Now remember there's no quotient rule, right, for for integrals. So what you got to do is divide through by the x squared and rewrite this guy as 1 plus 1 over x squared, which is also x to the negative 2 dx. So now, continuing, we will have 2 times whoops, x plus x to the negative 1 over negative 1 from x equal 1 to x equal to 3, which will give us 2 times x minus 1 over x from x equal 1 to x equal 3, which is 2 times, so our upper limit of integration will give us 3 minus a third and then minus the lo our lower limit, which will be 1 minus 1 over 1. So we will have 2 times 1 minus 1, do you see it's 0? So 3 minus a third would be 9 minus 1 all over 3. 
minus 0. And so now we will get that's going to be 16 thirds. So that's our average value. Okay. Now, the second fundamental theorem of calculus, okay, second fundamental theorem of cal calculus basically says, hey, if you have, if you're evaluating the derivative with respect to x, okay, of the integral from some constant to x, now since we've got x in the limits of integration, we need to parameterize, so we'll put a t instead of an x, so we'll have some function evaluated at t with respect to t, okay? So basically, the fundamental theorem of calculus, second fundamental theorem of calculus says, hey, if you're differentiating this, you're going to end up at the end of the day getting f of x. Okay? So, here we go. You can literally work it out, okay? And what will happen is, if you have your capital F at X is this, right? Then if we figure out what that integral is, GC, you would end up with T minus 1 half T squared evaluated from T equals 3 to T equal to X. So then that would give us capital F of X is X minus one half X squared minus three minus, let's see, that'd be three squared is nine, so we three minus nine halves. So capital F of X is going to equal to X minus one half X squared. Three minus nine halves would be what? Six minus nine is negative three halves, and then it would flip, so plus three halves. Right? Now, what if I differentiated both sides with respect to x. Okay. Well, I would get capital F prime at x is equal to 1 minus x plus 0, right? So I would get capital F prime at x is equal to 1 minus x, which, remember our original function at t was 1 minus t, so this is our original function in terms of x. So we literally could have said, oh, if capital F if capital F at X is equal to this integral from this constant to X, 1 minus T dt, then if I differentiate both sides with respect to X, what will happen is, on the left side, I'll get F, capital F prime of X is equal to 1 minus X. I could have gone straight there by the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay? So, here we go. So, I put the theorem up there for you. So, let's do this guy. What do you think? What's this going to be? Using the, you want to use the second fundamental theorem. Beautiful. This is just going to be x squared plus 7.
by the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Isn't that awesome? Now, sometimes things, you know, can get a little more... Actually, we're good. Okay. Here we go. Let's take a little look right here. Sometimes you don't have a, you know, you don't have it set up perfectly, right? So you might have to, you might have to play around with it a little. So remember that, would you agree that if you have this d dx, right, and if you multiplied by du over du, you're just multiplying by 1, right? So this can literally be written as d du times du dx, okay? So if you have something like it, this, this next example, right, where you have, um, oh, you know what, I have all this right here. Okay, my spacing's off. <laughs> That's all right. Okay, so here, continuing, we'll go back to that problem in a minute. Basically, what we do for the same reason is we, we come over here and we say, oh, okay, keeping in mind that d dx is equivalent to d du times du dx, right? And keep in mind these are all being multiplied. Then we can write this as d du times the integral from a to u, which is equal to this g of x, whatever that is. And then at the end of the problem, right, when you're done, after you do this u substitution, you have to multiply by du dx. Okay? So let's go back to this guy, which is just normal because it's a constant 0 to x. So what are we going to get for this? Beautiful. x to the fourth over. 1 plus x to the 6, and that's by the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And we can do that because of this d dx in front of it. Okay, so now let's take a look at this guy. d dx, do you see now we have 1 to x squared, not a constant to x, a constant to x squared. So you come over here, you let u equal to what? Good, x squared, right? And then what would du dx be? Perfect, 2x. So now we rewrite this as, this is going to be equal to d du of the integral from 1 to u of natural log at t dt times du dx. But we already figured out what the du dx is, right? So this guy here, by the second fundamental theorem, will just be natural log at u, right? And then times du dx, which we said was 2x. So we would get 2x times natural log at x squared. And we're done. And a problem like that, at this point in your math life, you would have to do you know, you don't know, have a formula for the integral of natural log at t dt, right? So, um, you know, the, this is definitely something you'd use, you'd need to use a fundamental theorem on. You couldn't figure out the integral and then differentiate. Okay, so what about this guy? What about this guy? Okay, so what's our u? Good, our u is cosine at x. And du dx is? Great, negative sine at x. So, 
coming over here, we're going to say, okay, this is equal to d du of the integral from 0 to cosine at x. Nope, sorry, to u. <laughs> and then the integrand will be 1 minus t squared dt. And then we take care of that substitution by multiplying by du dx. So that's going to be great. The square root of 1 minus u squared times negative sine at x, and then back substituting our u and writing it prettier, we'll have negative sine at x times the square root of 1 minus cosine squared at x. And couldn't we do something nicer with that? That would be negative sine at x times the square root of sine squared at x, right? Which we could write as negative sine at x times the absolute value I'm not sure if we need that. We'll just be on the safe side and we'll put the absolute value of sine at x. Okay? Alrighty. So now uh, we're on the net change theorem. The net change theorem. I'm just going to, not sure why the visuals didn't come out. Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna copy and paste this one. It's it's an interesting uh, it's interesting um, an interesting little theorem. It, it applies to some of the real-world problems. Oops. Okay. So the net, the net change theorem basically says um, that the definite integral of the rate of change of quantity f prime of x gives the total change or net change in that quantity on the closed interval from a to b. So if you have the integral of um, the prime of an antiderivative at x with respect to x, then that's just going to be equal to f at b minus f at a. Okay, so here Let's take a look. Uh, we've got this, this oil leak going on, right? And we've been given a rate. So that tells us it's our capital F prime at x, right? So capital F prime at t, rather, in this case, will be equal to 4 plus 0 0.75 t. And a in this first problem is going to be 1, right? And our b will be 4, right? So here we go. So how much oil is lost? Well, this would be the integral from 1 to 4 of 4 plus 0.75t with respect to t. And so that's going to equal to, we need to get our antiderivative. So that'll be 4t and then plus, what's that going to be? 0. Point Three seven five. Does that look good? <laughs> so point seven five divided by two. I think we're good there. And then um, 
t squared, so I already divided that 2. And then that's going to be from t is 1 to t is 4. So that'll give us 16 plus 0.375 times 16. And then that's our, so that's our upper limit minus 4 plus 0 0.375. So what we'll have is graph and calculator. Okay, so we'll have um, sixteen plus point three seven five times sixteen equals 22. So that'll equal to 22 for the first one and then minus 4.375 which will be 0.375 17.625. So how much oil is lost? 17.625 um, gallons. Okay? And that's from 1 to 4. Now how about from 4 to 7? Right? So now we do the integral from 1 to 4 of 4 plus 0 0.75t with respect to t. We already found what it was, right? So we know that that's going to be, actually this isn't going to be from 1 to 4, my bad. It'll be from 4 to 7, right? So we have our 4t plus 0.375t squared. And that's now from t is 4 to t is 7. So that's going to give us, let's see, 28 plus 0 0.375 times 49. And then minus. 4n. We did that last time, right? So we get 16 plus 0 0.375 times 16. So let's see what we get. So this one I think had a value of 22, right? So we don't need to do that again. We just need to do the first one. So 28 plus 0.375 times 49. Enter. And then this time we'd be subtracting 22 from that. So we get 24.375. And that's in gallons. So what do we notice about this? How do we notice? We notice that the it's increasing, right? So more oil is lost from 
4 to 7 p.m. And so we'd want to figure out why, right? You know, is there more pressure that's pumping out more oil on this leak? What's going on, right? Okay, so then, okay, so now let's take a look at this integral from 0 to pi of cosine at x dx, right? And what if we wanted to figure out the total area, right? So let's take a look at it. A picture of it, right? So let's um, go to our y equals. Clear. Whoops. Clear this guy. I'll clear this guy. And we're doing cosine at x. Okay, so let's just take a look. I've set it up where we can take a look at what that area looks like under under the curve, right? Um, so so if we graph this, let's go to um, what was it from zero to pi? So if we do our window, and if our if we do like uh, what negative point one to uh, pi is what, 3.14, so I'll do 3.2, so we have a feel for it, do our graph. Look what happens, right? So you've got positive y values here, right? And um, and you've got, oh, let me do, let me do one other thing. So what's going to happen is basically the area do you see would be canceling itself out? So here, let me get, let me get this to, uh, to graph. Okay, let's check this out. So what's happening here? For area problems is this. You know, we were given this formula, right, or this theorem to help us find area. But what happens here is that this part of the region is fine, right? So this part, this first part here is just fine, right, because the y value is positive. But under here, you're not, you, you, you've got this region, right, but it is, in, but it is negative. And so when you, when you, if you were to evaluate the definite integral, you know, all of this region would be subtracted. It would be negative, right, because the change in x is always positive. So this region right here would end up being negative, right? So here, cosine at x is less than or equal to zero, so the integral has negative values, okay? And over the other side, you know, cosine at x is greater than or equal to zero. So the integral has positive positive values. And obviously, you know, it's bounded between negative one and one, I, you know. Um, I, that's not the point I'm trying to make here. Um, so here, what we need to do is, um, if you're finding, trying to find the area, one way you could do it, since there's symmetry here, you know, to find the area, 
you'd either have to do something like this. So you could do the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine at x with respect to x, right? And then you'd have to add the opposite, right? Or the absolute value of the integral from 0, not 0, from pi over 2 to pi of cosine at x with respect to x. Or you could just flip the sign, right, on it knowing what the interval that it's going to be negative. So in this case, right, what would happen, right, we would get our area would be sine at x from x is 0 to x is pi over 2 and then plus the absolute value of sine at x evaluated from x is pi over 2 to x is pi so let's see what we would get so we would get Oh, actually, I left my myself room to work. I'll just go down here. So we would end up getting we would end up getting um, sine at pi over two minus sine at zero plus the absolute value of sine at pi over 2 minus sine at pi. And this is going to give us 1 minus 0 plus the absolute value of one minus Oh, whoops. The absolute value of sine at pi minus sine at pi over 2. So this guy will give us 1 minus 0. Over here we'll have the absolute value of 0 minus 1. So we get an overall value or area of 2 square units. Now another way, noticing the symmetry, right, couldn't we have doubled the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine at x with respect to x, right? Then we would end up having the area is 2 times what? Remember we got sine at x evaluated from x is 0 to x is pi over 2 and then that would be 2 times sine at pi over 2 minus sine at 0, which would give us 2 times 1 minus 0, which is 2 square units. So you have to be careful. You have to look at what you're being asked. The actual integral would end up being 0. The definite integral from 0 to pi would be 0 of that, of cosine at x. But the area, if you're being asked for area, is 2 square units. Alright, so that's it for today. Have a good one. Bye.